We have a new format this week for the American Express. It is a two-course event this year as opposed to a three-course, which means the cut is a round earlier. Oh, goody. What could be better than that? We're going to break down the new format for the American Express, discuss what it means for PGA DFS, and let you know who we are targeting this week for PGA DFS on FanDuel. Welcome on into the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by NumberFire. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Brandon Gadula. He is the managing editor for NumberFire.com. Brandon this past week, you have an, you had an outright on Joaquin Neiman. Didn't win, but by finishing second, you defeated me in our weekly head-to-head, the bobble hat. Uh, so for the second consecutive week, it came down to the final hole, came down to finishing position. This time, you were victorious, so congratulations to you. How you doing? I uh, would be doing better if uh, not for Kevin Na birding the 18th and maybe Joaquin Neiman going to a second straight playoff, maybe winning this time because he wouldn't be sitting around at a picnic table with uh, Sergio um, and and their partners just kind of waiting. He still was catching flack for how he approached last week's uh, playoff against Harris English. But, I mean, can't win them all. It's hard enough. And I had Russell Henley and Joaquin Neiman just because I got them uh, at good numbers. They weren't specifically plays I was heavy on. Um, But, you know, sometimes you just have to not get out over your skis a little bit. And, you know, when I saw Daniel Berger, who was my pick on the podcast, his number was way too short. So I was like, it's going to be it's going to be frustrating if Berger wins and I don't, you know, don't bet him. But I didn't like the number anymore. So I just went with Neiman uh, Henley and a few other guys. But, you know, it's a little frustrating, but it was nice to pick up uh, the bobble hat when I I think it's now three to one. Sure. Since the Masters. Sure. Let's go with but, that. I, mean, it's, I, know, it's I don't want to know the actual number. We'll just say three to one. That's less embarrassing. I mean, that's just, that's fine. Um, but back to back second place finishes for Neiman on Bermuda. Are we seeing a transformation where you can finally like not have a course specific view of Joaquin Neiman? Can I finally start to like not cross him off when he's not on Bentgrass? Um, so here, here's the here's the thing. Like to win a, a PGA event, you kind of need to gain. I I, sh- I always wanted to look this up, but I never do. You, you need to gain like four plus strokes with putting. I mean, unless you're that good, tee to green. Uh, the the past two events combined with those two runner ups, he's gained two point four and one uh, stroke from putting. So like, he's still doing it primarily with ball striking uh, with the tee to green play, not necessarily gaining a ton with the putter, but Here's the difference. Like, he's a fantastic tee to green golfer, same as like Hideki. But Hideki will, if he's losing four strokes every event, basically, if Neiman can be even neutral to that, like, you know, one to two and a half range, I think that we can probably shed that, uh, you know, only on bent grass uh, moniker, not moniker, but, you know, that perception of Neiman. I will happily take that. Unfortunately, Neiman is not in the field for this week, nor is John Rahm. He went through yesterday afternoon. He was plus 650 to win. So the clear favorite, he is no longer there. So a lot to break down for this week. Before we take a look at the American Express, quick reminder, Brandon is now doing weekly Q&As around PGA, talking both DFS and betting. That is every week at Tuesday, Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern on the FanDuel YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Periscope channels. He will go through his win simulations, compare golfers head-to-head, uh, let you check out his spreadsheets uh, live on air on the FanDuel YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Periscope pages. And you can also ask questions. There were some questions around current form last week talking through how you value that, um, specific golfers as well. So make sure you tune in today, 3.30 p.m. Eastern, on the FanDuel YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, or Periscope channel. Get those questions in for the American Express and let Brandon guide you down the right path for this weekend. Let's talk about this weekend because what? what? I hope it's the right path because... I mean, it's been good the last two weeks. I'm going to go... I am okay. This is my most relevant sample on you Mm -hmm. is the past two weeks. It's been good. Therefore, I will fully trust in it with no reservations. Sue me. Uh, Traditionally, the American Express has been a three-course pro-am. This year, just two courses, not a pro-am, which means the 
The rounds will take less than 15 hours, which is a plus. Uh, they will, but that the the con is that the cut will now be after 36 holes instead of 54. So, oh boy, uh, they're taking out La Quinta and using just the PGA West Stadium course and the Nicholas Tournament course. So. We don't have uh, strokes gain data from Lakita to begin with. All the strokes gain data is from PGA West Stadium course. That will still be there this year. They will have one round there on Thursday or Friday, and then both the weekend rounds will also be at the PGA West Stadium course. That's the main course for us to study this weekend. It is 7,113 yards. It is a par 72. The Nicholas Tournament course, again, just one round there. 7,152 yards, a par 72 uh, if you're looking for past data on this event and you're not looking at the courses, uh, search for the Desert Classic, the Career Builder Challenge, the Humana Challenge, et cetera, et cetera. It's gone through like 97 different names. So I would just search by course if you can. That makes it a lot easier. Specifically, again, focusing on the PGA West Stadium course. Now, Brandon, we do have strokes getting data from that course specifically. What can you learn from looking at that data in past events here? I mean, this is a tough one because that means we have two rounds uh, for golfers who may, you know play what we would typically call the weekend, but play on Sunday. Uh, just two rounds of strokes gain data. So if you're looking back, keep that in mind. We don't know uh, what happened for two of the rounds for golfers who even you know even if they played all four rounds. So it is a little more difficult than usual. Uh, we do have just a lengthy history, but uh, the you know the resource I love to use for finding out what's most important. Uh, is data golf. Uh, if we look at the snapshots from there, approach play does matter. Uh, more at this event, I'm going to say, I need to call it an event uh, because it's not this course. Um, but, but approach play matters more uh, than the usual PGA Tour uh, courses. So does driving distance. If we look primarily at the stadium course, which is, I think, the right way to play it. Uh, we have Bermuda greens at both courses. Um, and honestly, I think one of the things that's helped me most is actually emphasizing putting. Um, we have been historically low on putting, but I think over the last year or so, I've changed my tune. I've been trying to make sure that, uh, you know, my golfers are not at the bottom of the barrel, are not losing uh, tons of strokes. I've basically quit playing guys like Hideki, uh, Keegan Bradley, a few others uh, who we've historically loved. So that's been helping me. So I would say uh, Bermuda putting is a key stat, but honestly, with the setup uh, being multi-course, uh, with the iffy history, I want to keep this one. I, I want to keep this one pretty straightforward. I'm going to go with strokes gain approach as my top key stat, as usual. Driving distance, strokes gain putting on Bermuda, and just birdie or better rate. I think that's you know going to lead me to the best process plays of the week, and you know I don't think I need to complicate it more than that. Yeah, looking back at uh, past events here, so the the length of the course is not very long, especially for a par 72, and that led me to believe that maybe I could de-emphasize distance, but I checked out the data golf thing that you'd mentioned. That said that distance mattered quite a bit, and then you look at the ranking, the full season ranking of golfers who have done well here in the past, and it hasn't really mattered in which area they have excelled. It's just been, you know, are you a good driver? You can be someone who is not super long. You can be someone who is not super accurate. You just need to be a good driver. So I wound up going strokes gained off the tee as opposed to distance, which does have a pretty heavy overlap. It's mostly so we're kind different. of in the same place via a different route. But I think that if you were to look at just the distance here, you might think that distance doesn't matter. But I think that based on past data, I feel like that might be a, a false takeaway from that one data point. Yeah, um, and just trying to project historical uh, strokes gained off the tee. I, I've looked a lot at you know what is actually in strokes gained off the tee, and it seems like distance makes up the majority to you know fairways hit or you know driving accuracy, fairways gained, however you want to look at it. So it's totally fine just to use uh, strokes gained off the tee this week. It's probably you know a better way to look at distance anyway but you know i think this week specifically i'm going to trust uh what i'm seeing and and put uh strokes gain or, or distance over strokes gain off the tee but strokes gain off the tee is still something that i am considering yeah and i think that again the overall point is don't look at accuracy i think that's what, what i'm trying to say here yeah. just don't look at accuracy oh, yeah. 
uh, is the main takeaway from this. We're going to take a look at golfers who have done well at this event in the past in just one second. But first, sports betting is great. Sports betting with FanDuel Sportsbook is even better. Right now, FanDuel Sportsbook is giving you a chance to bet on any sport with reduced risk with their exclusive same-game parlay insurance. Simply place a three-leg or more parlay to be eligible for the offer and follow along as the game unfolds. If you don't win your bet, FanDuel will refund your bet up to $25 in site credit. What do you have to lose? Head to FanDuel Sportsbook and place your same game parlay today. Must be 21 plus and present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia, Indiana, Colorado, Tennessee, or Iowa. Refund issued is a non-withdrawable site credit. Max refund $25. Terms apply. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Or in Colorado, call 1-800-522-4700. In West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. In Indiana, call 1-800-9-WITH-IT, or in Tennessee, call the Tennessee Red Line, 1-800-889-9789. Let's dig into past history here at the American Express or whatever else has been called throughout the years and start things off here with Adam Hadwin. Adam Hadwin, $9,800. Brandon was not here last year, but before that, ripping things up, what do you see with Hadwin at a mid mid-range salary? Yeah, I was excited to talk John Rom because we don't typically talk the elite with good history, but, and I had this whole corollary course thing, but I'm going to go with H- Adam Hadwin uh, because John, John Rom withdrew. Um, to spite you. It was intentionally just to get back at you. You know, he and I have a back and forth. Uh, you know, I, I was, he didn't explain why he didn't answer me. Maybe it's not his number. I don't know, but uh, maybe, maybe you did something. <laughs> it's actually not John Rom. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, we have Adam Hadwin below 10, 10,000 on FanDuel, which is always, um, a, a good number uh, to target in terms of salary. Uh, missed the event last year due to uh, the birth of his child. Um, but he's been here a lot before that. He's been very good here. Debuted with a 48th uh, place finish in 2015. And then 6th, 2nd, 3rd, 2nd. So no wins, but four straight top 10s. More specifically, four straight top 6s. The putting has been there. But more importantly to me... Of the possible, of the ten possible off the tee and approach numbers in these five starts, so approach and off the tee in each of the five starts, that gives us ten total data points. Only one of those ten was negative. Uh, that's when he lost 0.9 strokes off the tee uh, in 2017. Of course, that's not it's not every round, but it is what we have to sort of go off of, and been you know golfing well in terms of finishes. So, you know. I'm I'm good with that, and even in that that year where the driving wasn't great, uh, the putting was there. That kind of checks out for him, sort of long term. Uh, he's seventy in the seventy eighth percentile in adjusted strokes gained since the start of the twenty twenty season, according to Data Golf. He's not super long off the tee. He's not amazing on Bermuda, but he's still in the sixty sixth percentile. Putting on Bermuda over the past one hundred rounds, I think with the lack of like high-end stars now with Rom out of the field, I can more justify, I can more easily justify a, a balanced lineup. So I think Hadwin's actually interesting, despite the fact that we don't typically put course history at the forefront. I don't really see anything in the current form necessarily to get me too far off of Hadwin. So uh, what, what are your thoughts here? I'm pretty wary due to the current form personally. Um, I think that you were talking about adjusted strokes gain, and that's important because Hadwin does go to a lot of tough events. Uh, so it's important to take these numbers with like a grain of salt. But if we go from like, let's say August on, uh, here are his uh, approach numbers: 0.6 gained, negative 0.06 or negative 0.6, negative 3.7, 1.1, negative 3.8, negative 2.7, negative 2.8, negative one. Nothing for the Masters, you know, whatever. Um, negative 0.7 at the RSM. Miscut at the OHL where there's no strokes gain data, the approach play looks pretty bad. Um, and not all those events are super tough. So I would say if the salary were lower, I could bite. But like, I think when you combine the salary with the current form, which I think is actually pretty concerning, I, mean, I would have a hard time buying in personally. I agree with your point, though, that a balanced roster makes a lot of sense this weekend, though. So I would agree wholeheartedly with that. I just don't think that Hadwin would be the guy I'd be targeting within that balanced build. Yeah, that's fine. I think it depends, too, on how you define current form more at long-term form. The the more recent form, yes, is troubling, uh, but I think that it, it's 
Hadwin has the right game to sort of figure it out. Um, he he's had a lay uh, six weeks basically since the Mayakoba. So um, I'm fine going there if I need to. I really just honestly don't like too many golfers this week to begin with. Um, I think it's a pretty – the field just drops off to me quickly and yeah. harshly. So I think by default – like if you look at the 9,000 range, there's like one or two golfers I actively would want to play. So I think based on that, Hadwin is fine. Um, but I think that's kind of the field that I'm looking at this week. Yeah, I think there are I, there might be more guys I like. Um, I like the low 9,000 range more than usual, I guess, is the way that I'd phrase it. Uh, there are guys who definitely have flaws. I'm not counting EVR in that, by the way. I'm not counting Eric Van Royen. Um, he's not part of that equation. Not saying I won't use him, but that's not part of the reason I like the low 9,000 range. I think I'm more into it, which is why I'm okay passing over Hadwin. And one of the reasons I do like this field is I think that there are guys who fit it really well. And one of those guys is Sam Burns, who has done well here in the past. Let's talk about Sam Burns. You mentioned the importance of distance in the open, and we know Sam Burns has that. And it's helped him put together good finishes here the past two years. First trip for Sam Burns was in 2019, finished 18th, followed that up with a sixth last year. And Burns' sixth was, despite gaining just 0.1 strokes off the tee, he gained 2.7 on approach and 2.5 around the green. But like with Burns, your baseline assumption is that he's probably going to gain on his first shot more often than not. And Burns' approach has been trending up of late. He's also a great Bermuda putter. So he's 10-3. Usually that's an awkward salary because you get in your two studs, you plug in you know 9,000-ish type guys from there. Although that's awkward, I think that it's worth targeting this week. I think that Sam Burns is like maybe not a priority play, but he's a he's close to being a priority play for me, even if it does lead to altered roster construction. I think a balanced build this week has a lot of value, and Burns is part of the reason I want that build. Are you on board with that process, specifically with Sam Burns? Yeah, I like Burns. Uh, that This is his checklist this week, distance and Bermuda. Um, he's... You know, we would consider him historically in the like high salary range, so it's hard to compare him to someone like a Matthew Wolf, for example. But uh, among golfers above ten thousand, he's not. Then that's a that's a big range, and that's also the range with the best golfers in the field. I still consider him like a top five play in that range. Um, I also like Cameron Champ right above him. I've been going with a more balanced construction for a long time, almost always. This week, I'm probably not going to do that. I'll probably skip over most of the 9,000 range entirely because I don't view that tier to be completely different than the 8,000 tier. And that way I can get to someone like a Burns, uh, Cam Champ uh, in the low 10,000 range. Then actually build around Adam Hadwin, who I do think is fine. Um, But I I just, I think that's probably the way that I'm going to wind up playing it. Uh, Bump down to the low 9,000s or try to get up to Burns and up. For the yeah. most part, I do like Champ as well. The reason I would go to Burns over Champ is that the putting is pretty significantly different. Yeah. So I think that's that's the difference maker for me with going with Burns. But I agree, if I wound up with both in the same lineup, I'm not going to complain about that. I think that's a totally viable way to play things this week and probably a roster construction I will utilize at some point. Let's get down to some lower salary golfers here with good form at this event. Starting with Andrew Landry, and he's eighty three hundred dollars and defending winner. So, what are you seeing with him here? Yeah, I don't think we ever talk about Andrew Landry um, ever. Like, it just doesn't really seem to come up very much. But he's got it figured out at this event. Uh, last year's winner, twenty uh, eighth in twenty nineteen, runner up to John Rahm in twenty eighteen, um, and he has really good uh, tee to green and ball striking numbers in this format. Again, it's not complete data, but we can probably extrapolate that the ball striking works out overall over the four rounds. If it was really good in the two rounds and, you know, he's finishing top two in those events, uh, he's gained strokes in 12 of 15, uh, rounds. They're just total. We, we can, we don't need shot link to know total strokes gain. Cause that's just your strokes gain relative to the field. But, you know, with that gained in 12 of 15 rounds, uh, in this event, 
uh, in that sample. Uh, he's in the 30th percentile, though, in adjusted strokes gain since the start of the 2020 season. Not particularly long, just the 22nd percentile in driving distance gained over the past 100 rounds, according to Fantasy National. So doesn't really seem to suit him, but the results would say otherwise. So uh, is the course history enough for you to go at Landry? Anything else that you see here to get us on Andrew Landry at 8,300? So I will say first, I don't think I'll be needing golfers in the 8,300 range all that often, just because I do like the 9,000 range more than you do. So I probably won't need to get down here personally, mm-hmm. especially like with no ROM. I I like Cantlay, but like I don't need to, you know, bend over backwards to get him. Um, so I probably won't be here that often. I will say, though, that I am more receptive to course history as a pitch, as a sales pitch for someone when they're $8,300 versus like 10 3 which it feels like that's where we usually find you know, the quote unquote course horses and and Andrew Landry definitely does qualify as being that. Um, So I'm more receptive to it there. I think that like it, it could be fine. Um, I I guess like it's hard to nitpick too much when someone's salary is that low, you're probably not going to find imperfect golfers down that low either. So I don't think he's a cross off. I also like if I'm talking realistically right now, I think the odds that I use him are very low, but like, it's not, it's not the worst idea in the world. Just probably not what I'm going to utilize myself. Is that a fair way to phrase it? Oh yeah. It's, it's fair. Um, he's not long. Uh, the irons are just sort of okay. I mean, for the salary, they're fine. Um, not particularly good on Bermuda. So I don't really see the reason, um, to play him. I, am going to be in this range, I think, um, because I'm probably skipping over most of that upper 9,000 range. And rostering one golfer down around this salary can kind of open up a lot. And I think that's a little more justifiable uh, in a course or in an event that's not star-driven, uh, and the scoring should kind of be there overall. So it's not going to be Landry, but I will be down here more than he will. Yeah, I think that your reasoning for getting down here is in order to get more 10,000 golfers, correct? Yes. So we're both taking different routes to get to the same endpoint. The the endpoint for both of us is we like the 10,000 range. You're just using more of the 8,000 golfers to get there, whereas I am using balanced across the board, I think, correct? Yes, but that could be the difference between like a Tony Finau and Sam Burns maybe or someone near Burns who we don't like as much, but... I think if the, you know, I'll, I'll try to come up with a, a 2v2 that it okay, sort of sure. explains what I'm doing. But yeah, that sounds good. Uh, while you're doing that, I'll talk about Taylor Gooch, who is in that low 9,000 range. Yeah. And he's part of the reason I'm actually okay with it. Doesn't have an overly long history at this event. Uh, this will be his fourth time here, but 67th in 2018. Past two years have been good for him, though. He finished fourth in 2019th and, and 17th last year. And most of the work he did last year came on La Quinta and the Nicholas course because he was at just 1.8 strokes gained in two rounds at the stadium course. That could be a red flag with hopefully three rounds at this course this week. But in 2019, Gooch gained 3.8 on approach there, 7.4 T to green across three rounds. He is, or across two rounds, I should say. Gooch is coming off a missed cut at the Sony where he lost 2.1 approach. So that's concerning, but the stats profile overall for Gooch is pretty balanced, especially for someone who is $9,200. You tend to be more on Gooch than I am, but I think that I could be there this week. Uh, What's your read on Taylor Gooch here at $9,200? Like Gooch a lot. Um, He's one of my player picks coming off two straight missed cuts, but digging deeper, Missed, missed one on the number, missed one by one uh, one shot. Uh, we see really balanced profile from Gooch. Um, two top 17s at this event, which lends me to think that he can get back on track. And just no real no real issues for him uh, in the profile, and that's kind of what, what gets me on him more than anything. Yeah, I think that if you can find a well-rounded golfer in this salary range – that tends to grade out pretty well. So Gooch, someone, uh, the course history is not the reason that I'm here, but like it helps, you know, it's nice to know that he's done well here in the past. He's been here in the past, had success. I think that's all reassuring. Do you have a two V two pulled up here for some comparison? Um, I mean, you're going to nitpick because I'm just trying to like, yeah, 
I'm just going to like throw out an example. Uh, it would be something like a Finau and Matthew Neesmith or like a Russell Knox, Kevin Na sort of salary discrepancy. Um, that's about the same. If you want to talk like, let's do champ and who else do you like down here? In which range? Like low 9,000s, Cameron Davis. Um, Sure. So I guess champ and Cameron Davis or Finau and Neesmith. Ch- I like think that's Champ pretty and, even, honestly. Champ and Gooch. I mean, look, I like Cam Champ, but he's no, not Tony Finau just yet. And Tony yeah. Finau's not perfect, but I mean, even if you don't make it Finau, uh, Wolf, you know, Sung JM, Scotty Scheffler, something like that, getting up from like a Champ or, you know, who else is in that range? We love Paul Casey, but, you know, right now. Um, I'm not going to Paul Casey. <laughs> but like, you know, Ricky Fowler, Cam Champ, Paul Casey. If you can get up to you know, a Wolf, Sungjae, Finau, and the drop is from like Gooch or Cameron Davis to like a Matthew Neesmith or something. Um, I think that's that's ultimately what's going to drive my main lineup this yeah. week. I will say the the other thing is I am planning on having multiple guys in that tier already. Um, so the Champ versus Finau discussion is pertinent because, you know, if Cam Champ is my number two in my lineup, I could make Finau that guy instead. So I think that's a pertinent discussion for sure. Um, I just happen to have a little bit more faith in the low 9,000 range than you do. Gooch is part of that for sure. Um, but I think the, the point you're making is fair. Let's move into the current forum discussion here and talk about some golfers who are coming in hot, one of whom is Scotty Scheffler. He is 11-3, and he is at the top end. We have not talked a lot about the studs here because Ron withdrew. So let's start that discussion here with Scotty Scheffler. I think this low 11,000 range is really fun. There are multiple names there I would love to target. I think that Scheffler obviously is one of them. What are you seeing with Scheffler in his recent data? Yeah, I mean, there's no Justin Thomas, Dustin Johnson, John Rahm, you know, those no Rory, Xander. There's probably the top five for like everyone right now. If you t- put Xander out of that, I mean, don't talk to me, but um, I think that's uh, right now we're looking at. Uh, can't lay at 11 8. Brooks, Patrick Reed, Scheffler, Tony Finau, Sung GM, Matthew Wolf. Like, those are the 11K guys. That's a good tier. Um, it's not, you know, we don't, I don't think that you can realistically make the case for one of those guys as the definitive stud. So I think anyone in this range is, is worth discussing to try to figure out how we want to approach, you know, the top whatever, six or seven names I just mentioned. But Scheffler's really interesting. He enters this week with three top 20 finishes over his past four. Those were the Zozo, the Masters, and the Tournament of Champions. But the iron play is not quite what we've seen from him typically. Uh, over 22 measured rounds in, in the 2021 season, he's averaging negative 0.41 adjusted strokes gain from approach. Uh, according to Data Golf. last season he was at a positive 0.5 over 71 measured rounds. Did finish third here last year. Uh, Bermuda putting is a concern for him. Uh, but Scheffler kind of fits the overall vibe. We know that he can be one of the best iron players in any field uh, you know, that he plays in. He's long off the tee. He finished well here before, so that kind of helps calm the nerves a bit. So is, is Scheffler, does he do enough relative to these other big names? Or are you probably ranking him toward the bottom of this top tier? Not towards the bottom, I don't think. I think that he definitely deserves to be in the mix in consideration for the top end. I think that the approach play concerns are enough where he's not my favorite guy in this range. Uh, But like, I definitely think he's in the mix. I would say, like, I like the lower end of this range quite a bit. So it's Scheffler, Wolf, Sungjae, and Finau. I think all those guys are really fun. And I'm, that's probably where I'm going to start off my lineup is with that group as opposed to, like, again, no, nothing against Patrick Cantlay, nothing against Brooks Kepka. They're totally fine. Uh, nothing against Patrick Reed. But I think I kind of like this lower end range a bit more. I think it gets me towards a balanced lineup, makes it easier to get to those guys. Uh, like, I could probably get two of these guys, honestly, and still have a fairly balanced lineup. And I find that pretty attractive. So, I think I'll be in this range quite a bit if I am ranking things. I feel like I initially would have had Matthew Wolf number one, but I'm kind of kind of feeling Sungjae a bit, kind of feeling Finau. It's tough. Sungjae's looked really... I know that things did not go well as the round went along last week, but like 
I'm feeling pretty good about Sung Jay. So I think I am going to wind up going Matthew Wolf one, but like Sung Jay's pretty good. I don't know. I think it's a good range. I think Scheffler is probably third or fourth in that list for me. What about you? Um, I like Patrick Reed a lot this week. You sent me a gif of Patrick Reed. Yeah, I, I, I didn't, I didn't dig in after that. You, but. You, no, and look, it, he's not, he's not long off the tee. Um, he's not short though. Uh, it's just mostly like now with Rom out of the field, he's the best golfer. He doesn't really have that perception because he's Patrick Reed. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's the, the truth. Um, but I think he's the most interesting. He would be the one I would feel best about uh, locking in in a cash game lineup. Uh, he, he odds on favorite for me in my in my win simulations. I don't know if odds on favorite qualifies there. I don't actually know what that means. I think sometimes I just throw it in when I say favorite. But most he's the most likely. Winner. Like I mean, that's what I think it means. Maybe it means something yeah. different. But uh, uh, Reed is the most likely golfer to win in my simulations. I like the the setup. The long term form is frankly better than the rest here with you take out rom pretty easily i uh, can't lay the closest but um i would have read number one and then for the savings because i i don't want to pretend like i'm going to get you know read brooks and can't land to a lineup I, I don't know i probably won't even play brooks i don't know if he's gonna <laughs> and i never know with brooks if he's gonna care um but i'd go read wolf Finau out of the top this week Okay, that's fair. Um, like Reed's numbers are good, so I think that your optimism around him is definitely justified. I just think the odds are the numbers are also good for the other guys who are a little bit less costly. That's the reason that I would be lower on Patrick Reed, but like from a process perspective, he makes a lot of sense. So I can't like push back too much. He's a good putter, like like you said, not long, but he he's, he has good stroking out the tee numbers. So. You know, I can't push back on that. Uh, but the overall takeaway here is we're both not putting Scheffler at the top of our list. Is that correct? No, not not at the top. Um, I think surprisingly you're not locking in Patrick Cantlay, which I think is telling uh, because he's your boy. Uh, so I think that with, with the stuff, I want to get two of these guys in every lineup probably because I don't think balance is the right way to go. I think th- these guys are, a, you know, a tier above everyone else and it's important to get exposure to, to multiple guys there i would agree i think that's the right 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 view things um you can still be balanced while doing that though and i think that's why it's reassuring for me because like the low the low with that eleven thousand range does not overextend you that much let's talk about Patton kazire because this season since the start of the uh, 2020 2021 season has been kind to him he started things off with a miscut at the safeway but kazire has made seven straight cuts since then most recently kazire has been Getting good finishes. He was 11th at the Houston Open, 10th at the RSM, and then last week finished 7th at the Sony, and that's good. The problem is that Kazire is doing all of this with the short game. He is 123rd off the tee and 133rd in approach the past 50 rounds. Still 12th in birdies or better game because of how good his short game is, but it feels pretty unsustainable, and he's in that Hadwin range at $9,900. I think that the finishes will be tough for him to keep up. So I'm going to stay away from Kazire despite the good finishes recently. What about you? Are you buying into what he's been doing recently or no? No, we talked about him recently. It's all short game, not really any ball striking. You don't want to chase that. Um, Typically, if a guy finishes well enough where where you pay attention, he's playing at the high end of the short game for the most part, unless we see a huge shift in his ball striking numbers. So you're kind of, you know, buying high on, on that profile, and I think that's a mistake. Which is why you should always look at the strokes gain data instead of the finishes, uh, and go from there. Yeah, I think that um, it's just tough to buy in, especially again, like we discussed with Hadwin, it's tougher to buy in at in the high nine thousands than it would be if he were a lower salary. So that allows me to feel pretty good in avoiding Kazire and hoping people chase the good finishes. Let's move now to Peter Malnati, eighty seven hundred dollars. We got a couple of guys here who are in the eight thousand range who could be interesting. Peter Malnati, eighty seven hundred dollars. Uh, what have you been seeing with him recently? Um, he's been like way off the radar for some time, uh, but has really showed something since October. He finished second at the Sanderson Farms when he gained four and a half strokes from approach and nine point two from putting. Was fifth at the Shriners for uh, gaining five point seven uh, strokes from approach. 
21st at the Bermuda, 48th at the RSM, cut at the OHL, 14th last week at the Sony Open after shooting a 62 uh, to you know tie for the first round lead. So he went 62, 69, 64, 69, which is you know pretty nice, all things considered. Um, he's like an S on Bermuda. He ranks in the 99th percentile. He's shown life with the irons in, in recent events. He is 33. Uh, the data says that you can trust shorter term uh, deviations when guys are a little younger, but he's not specifically old. Uh, the long term approach numbers, when adjusted for field, are just okay. 30th percentile. Um, he's not long off the tee, so not the best course fit, but I think there's enough given the salary to at least have some intrigue. Uh, any thoughts on Malnati at 8,700? Well, let's talk through Charlie Hoffman because some of the talking points overlap with him as with Malnati, except with uh, 11 years additional in age uh, with Hoffman relative to Malnati. Because uh, coming out of the COVID break, Hoffman was gaining strokes and approach. That was good. But he kept missing cuts because his off the tee play was pretty bad. And that has been starting to round back into form recently. Uh, we saw Hoffman gain 4.2 off the tee last week. That is the third time in the past five measured events he's gained at least 3.9 off the tee. So gaining quite a bit with his first shot. The approach is still there, too. He gained 4.9 there last week. And this has pushed Hoffman up to 41st in the field off the tee, 31st in approach, and 29th in birdies or better gained. He's also an above-average Bermuda putter. You, though, were cautioning against buying into improvements in all the golfers. And Hoffman is 44, not 33, like Malnati is. Uh, but he's also $8,900. And I think long-term, we have seen this from Charlie Hoffman before. It's not as if he's this is the first time. He's showing life in these departments. He might have just been in a funk coming off the COVID break. So will you believe it in Hoffman? And who are you more willing to buy into between Malnati and Hoffman? Probably Hoffman. Um, strong T degree numbers lately. Uh, we know that he's just a kind of a bigger, better name. Uh, he kind of gets into these swings, it feels like, where he golfs well and then falls off. Very turbulent. Uh event form with six missed cuts but three top tens in the past 11 years so i have hoffman and other to consider down in the value range i'm not quite there with monati but uh these guys are not that different to me than like the mid 9,000 range which is again why i'm okay bumping down to the upper 8k range uh, even lower range in order to get up to a second or potentially third stud depending on how you define that for this week I agree with you that the high 9,000 range is not very good. Um, I also don't like like the 9,500 range is not that good. I think it's the low 9,000 range where things start to pick back up. And I can fill out a lineup where I have like I have one in front of me. Wolf, Sungjae, Burns, mm -hmm. and I don't go below 9,000. Yeah. Like, to me, I think that build's pretty attractive this week. So I can yeah. avoid Hoffman, but I'm also willing to consider him in order to get a little bit higher in the upper tier range. So the 2v2 you were talking about is very valid. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. I think, like, look, I love Taylor Gooch. I, I would use him a lot, but, you know, whoever else you like in that low 9,000 range, I don't specifically know who it is. Probably Tringali, if I had to guess. Of uh, course. Good golly. Um, Good golly, Cam Tringali. But, yeah, I mean, if I have to go down to, like, Hoffman, maybe Tom Hoagie, uh, Neesmith, like, and that gets me up from, you know, whoever to – even even Burns, so like yeah, seven hundred. That that could work. They get to like from Burns to Wolf. Like that's yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, I can't push back on that. I think that the two v two example makes a lot of sense here, and I think that uh, there's value in that. So dig into those guys a little bit below the nine thousand range. See which ones fit your fancy. See how much juice the extra wiggle room gets you because it yeah. could be valuable. Yeah, it could. Um, these guys are not. They all got their issues. So, but honestly, the, the thing is, everyone below 10,000 has some issues to me, pretty much. So, right. And I think that's, that's why it's okay to go lower. Cause if you're taking on issues, you might as well take on less salary in doing so. So, I think that makes sense. Again, you're right. You won. Uh, bookmaker <laughs> odds for the thing. Was... <laughs> you're right. I can give you kudos when you're right uh patrick cantley is a favorite of fanduel sportsbook he is 14 to 1 i think he was 16 before rom dropped 
did not a lot of movement there, which is interesting. Uh, Brooks Kepka and Scotty Sheff are 17 to 1. Patrick Reed is 19 to 1 with Matthew Wolf and Sung JM at 20 to 1. Tony Finau is 21 to 1. Then it dips down to Russell Henley, who is 30 to 1. Abraham Answer is 32 to 1. And Ricky Fowler, who we have not mentioned yet, probably for good reason, uh, rounds up the top group at 38 to 1. And Brandon, when, you, when I list out these odds, they're a lot flatter than what we see. They're a lot longer for the top end guys than what we usually see. Does that influence how you're viewing things at all from a DFS perspective, knowing that there really isn't like a, a quote unquote favorite for this week? Yeah, I think the, the thing it does most is makes me believe that nobody's going to be super chalky. So I don't have to feel like I need to pivot away uh, from anyone in particular. I don't think there's going to be someone who's like 40% rostered. Uh, I think it's going to be way flatter than that, you know, similar to the, to the win odds. So I think that's the key takeaway for me is I have like less fear of missing out. Uh, yeah. I would say, you know, these numbers kind of bear, bear themselves out too. When I simulate this thing out, you know, I, I have Patrick Reed is uh, pretty, you know, fairly likely to win. He and Cantlay are kind of neck and neck, but they're both below 6%. Um, typically we see someone, you know, seven, eight, nine percent If Rom was in, he probably would have been like 12%, which is, you know, still sounds low, but that's twice as likely as, you know, right. someone at 6%. So I think that's the, the key uh, for me is not not having to sort of figure out what I'm going to do with John Rom this week. I was going to probably play a lot of John Rom, recommend a lot of John Rom. This week, I think it's more process oriented, uh, and that always makes me feel good. Uh, when I'd have to be a little bit less game theory dependent and and more, you know, play who I see uh, has the best fit for this week. Yeah, I think the takeaway for me was that I don't like. I was surprised. I guess I can't wait. Didn't shorten more than sixteen to fourteen one. I know that like he doesn't have the quote unquote like winner uh, air if we're gonna phrase it that way. Yeah. Um, but I think that that allowed me to feel more okay in passing over him. Well, I love Cantlay. I think he's amazing. But like the putting numbers are a concern. I'm guessing that why that's why he didn't shorten that much, despite the fact that Rom withdrew. So I, I think that it, it allows me to feel better about dipping into that eleven thousand range. Because I know that from a win equity perspective, if you look if you base that on the odds, I'm not missing out on that much by dipping down to guys like Wolf, like Sung Jay, like Finau, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that's that's valuable information to have for sure. Uh, which golfers odds have shifted drastically. I think that the ROM withdrawal makes things different, I guess. Uh, but who benefited and who, whose odds have shifted since what ROM withdrew? Um, yeah, I had to pull this a, a second time. Um, so not as much, not as big of a window for shifts, but there were some notable ones. Paul Casey from 70 to 50. Uh, from Monday into Tuesday, uh, since the the, the odds got reposted on FanDuel Sportsbook, Brian Harmon seventy five to fifty five. Uh, Kevin Stroman was one twenty to one. He's now one hundred to one. Uh, Cameron Tringali one ten to ninety five. So I know these are a little out of order, but I did it based on percentages of of change. Um, so, but Sc- Scotty Scheffler did move from nineteen to seventeen, and Cam Champ from forty six to forty two. So, really, the only movement inside forty to one was actually Scheffler. And then some notable names uh, that you know lengthened: Phil Mickelson from forty-five to one to eighty to one, uh, Russell Henley twenty-five to thirty, and Kevin Na thirty-four to forty. Poor Phil. Um, Kevin Streelman is someone we have danced around for the past couple of years. Have occasionally bought into him. He is shortened, which means there is betting interest in him. He's eighty-six hundred dollars. I think that the putting concerns prevent him from being someone that I feel really good using, but is he someone you're willing to consider this week? Um, what's the salary here? 86. 86. Uh, that's I mean, decent because we know how good he can be T to green. He's not specifically long. Yeah. Um, I am 34th percentile, which is not red flag territory. It's not, it's not dreadful. Um, it's mostly the putting. So I would keep it to sprinkles because, you know, he could, he could, in theory, we won't know this because we won't get strokes gained from both rounds before the cut, but he could, in theory, lead the field in strokes gained Tita Green. Still miss the cut because the putter can be that bad. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would, like you said, uh, keep it lower, 
but you know, if you're down there and you maybe this is probably a week where you lock in your three or four guys at the top and then rotate in down at the in the value range. And he would be part of that for me. Yeah. Uh Strillman 45th and stroking off the tee. So despite the fact that he's not long, he can still gain off the tee, which I think is valuable because again, look back at guys who have done well here in the past. It's not all long strikers. So I think that helps for Strillman, but I agree with your concerns on the putting. Could get gross. Uh, speaking of Strailman, which lower salary golfers have odds that stand out to you at FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, uh, I mean, not a ton. Uh, below 9,500, there was, I think, only one golfer at 75 to 1 or better. Um, his name escapes me. I just saw it, but uh, I'm going to stall here. Aaron Wise, yeah. 95 to 1. 70. Or 9,500, 75 to 1. I like Aaron Wise a lot. And he's any week, he's 9,500 on FanDuel. It tells you a lot about the field. Um, just just being honest. So if I look at uh, golfers at or below 9,000, the best odds belong to Keegan Bradley at 90 to 1. He's 8,900. Nope. Very similar case to Strillman, where the T to Green is going to be pretty good. Putter will be most likely terrible uh cameron Trangali, uh your boy 95 to 1 at nine thousand. uh joel damon our boy uh 100 to 1 same as charlie hoffman brandon Steele, kevin streelman so and if this is a week where you're you know if your process involves matching the the win odds to salary you're not going to find a ton it's probably going to lead you to a very balanced lineup i would think yes. it's probably not the, the way that i'm going to play it though so uh a year ago, I would have been all about Keegan Bradley. Yeah. Second in approach, 19th off the tee. I've been like, oh, buddy. I was yeah. just that he putts, but I've given up on that. So, yeah, oh, there well. are just certain guys. I mean, it's one thing to be like subpar putting. It's 163rd <laughs> in 150 golfer field. <laughs> It's an, it's and another to be that that. fantasy national data. They still had some guys who weren't in the field in there, and yeah. he is outside the realm of the field. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think at that point it's important to pump the brakes. Cause I mean, a missed cut, it kind of ruins a whole lineup if you're trying to. Oh, I'm aware, big. buddy. Yeah. Last week was, was grim. I had some good scores. Uh, was doing really well. So missed cuts burn that, uh, Jason Kokrak. Remember these Jason Kokrak burn that. So it's not pretty. Uh, we'll get into our player picks here in just one second, but first no weather to note this weekend could be a little bit damp on Thursday morning, but Nothing to be too worried about, and again, it's a bit different this week too. <laughs> what? I love that the the it, our our note sheet says weather, and then you wrote none, and I tried to think about what no weather would actually mean. It's not like Mars, but there's no. Well, I guess there's minimal atmosphere. I, like I don't, I don't know, but I was trying to think about it. I think Jim Fuhrer could be a long hitter on Mars because there's less gravity. And I personally like going to Mars. Apparently, messes up your DNA. But like Jim Fuhrer, probably not planning on having any additional kids. So we should send Jim Fuhrer to Mars, test out this theory, see what happens. I'm sure that was a very valuable I, 15 <laughs> seconds of discussion for all of you listening. You're welcome, Cal. I need you to cut up a soundbite where it's just Jim saying, "I think we need to send Jim, Jim Fuhrer to Mars." <laughs> I mean, I think no this context. is science. this is the name of science. So, <laughs> sorry you don't believe in science, Brandon. Welcome <laughs> to 2021. Uh, let's dive into our player picks here for the American Express. Brandon, in the upper tier on FanDuel, who are you targeting this week? I'm sticking with Patrick Reed. Um, I probably will bet him, even though the odds are a little shorter than I typically bet for an outright. I might not do that. I might just play my game and, and bump down the card but i like patrick reed a lot uh it's we need distance yes but he's fine in that department 52nd percentile he's just a really good golfer who doesn't quite get the credit because you know everything everything about patrick reed if we're being honest um he's my win simulation models favorite golfer to win uh one here in 2014 as well has five straight uh finishes of 21st or better uh and he's in the 87th percentile when putting on bermuda 77th percentile or better and all three adjusted T to green stats. So I don't really see any reasons to be off of Reed. And that puts me on to Reed this week. Your win sims being on people has been advantageous in the past. So maybe I need to warm to Pat Patrick Reed. 
it would feel bad to use in the bobblehead against you, given that you're more on him than I am. But like, you know, you can use it. Look, all I do, it's not it's not magic. It's I take long term data. Pretty sure it's magic and see who's being undervalued. And that's it. Sounds like magic to me. Uh, my first high salary guy is Matthew Wolf. He's not a great Bermuda putter, but he's not an active negative there, which I think is good. That's enough for me to go back to a guy who was really good to us over the summer. All of Wolf's other stats outside of the Bermuda putting are elite. 15th off the tee, 4th in approach, and 4th in birdies are better game the past 50 rounds. That is according to Fantasy National. He's had to rack up four top five finishes in 16 events after the end of the COVID layoff. He did miss four cuts, so there is still volatility in there for sure. Uh, but and this is the first time he's played since November, so we don't have like really recent data on Matthew Wolf. But I love the upside here. The course fit seems to be pretty good. I'm going to dabble in these waters for sure. Brandon, you did mention Wolf. I think second behind Patrick Reed. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, not from a you know, like a simulation standpoint, but just from a fit, from a stat standpoint, um, from the fact that. Wolf is very, very good. Uh, he, we know he can launch it off the tee, which is different than than you know the reason I'm in on Patrick Reed. Just a very, very good putter, like an underrated putter. Um, we, you know, have probably some of us have some memories of him missing putts uh, down the stretch. It certainly that sounds points. personal. Like it sounds like it's a personal anecdote of you missing out. It was at the U S open. Was that the one where you had him? I had him everywhere this year okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to have him everywhere again this year, uh, possibly including this week. If I, if I get there, um, but just long, good irons, good putting. You can't ask for much else. His, his lone red flag is around the green play which will always be the least important stat of the four. Yeah. He's 31 to one to win the masters. You want that? Oh, I've, I've been looking. Okay. Oh, Golf. I just asked me uh, to come up with some names who, who, who are going to win us money in 2021. Even though Matthew Wolf is, is a big name. I think that he's, uh, he's under, under appreciated. Well, let's start that this weekend then. Get Matthew Wolf a trophy this week. Who else do you like in this upper range on FanDuel? I'm going to go with Cameron Champ. I mentioned Finau is my third guy in that 11-plus uh, range, but I'm good with Cameron Champ at 10-6 as well. Uh, you know, not not the best iron player, but still 61st percentile in adjusted stroke skiing approach since the start of the 2020 season. That's uh, not bad uh, by any means. He's the longest driver in the field, uh, has field average Bermuda putting splits over his 62 rounds, uh, finished 21st year last year. So I'm good to take a chance on him, even at the elevated salary. Probably not a core play, pro probably not someone I would play in our head-to-head, -head, but I wouldn't be opposed to it either. Yeah, so while we were talking, I was editing our head-to-head -head lineup. I had Cam Champ in there at one point. He is no longer in there, utilizing some of the tricks we discussed on here. So you're actively helping me in my head-to-head -head against you. So Seems right. Congrats on that. I do think that Champ works for sure. I agree he's not a core play, but someone I will definitely use. Preferred target for me in this range is Sam Burns at 10-3. And like I said, it's kind of in a weird salary tier with no ROM. I think that, a, that having exposure to guys in this low 10,000 range is pretty valuable. We talked about Burns in the course history section and, and it makes sense. Burns is, uh, but Burns is also really good statistically. He is third off the tee, fourth in Bermuda putting 10th and birdies are better game the past 50 rounds. Thanks to what he's been doing in those two departments. And the approach has been trending up. At least it's not a strength for him yet, but it's getting better. He gained a 6.5 there at the Houston open 4.8 at the Workday Charity Open. So he can have pop weeks. And I think that's valuable. So I can probably get to Burns as my third golfer. That's what I have right now in a lineup, not specifically for you. Uh, but if I if I have to go with a balanced lineup where Burns is number two, I'm not opposed to that either. Like that's kind of weird from a, a, a win odds perspective, but I think that Burns is a very fair play and I want to make him a core play this week. What about you? I like Burns a lot. Um, I think I probably will miss out on him a little bit by default because I'm going to try to get three of like the Burns and up golfers that could include Burns mm -hmm. if very well might. Um, but I also like someone just below him uh, in Lonto Griffin. So I can 
talk about him. Do it. And, and why that makes sense. I had yeah. Adam Hadwin here, but you made me scared. Um, I still think he's a fine play, uh, but it's really hard to, to go against Lonto. And he's also 80 to 1 on FanDuel Sportsbook. So I think. You know, that's an intriguing outright uh, for for my boy. No red flags in his profile. He benefits from being on a course that, you know, emphasizes distance. It's Bermuda. He's in the 73rd percentile in distance, 83rd on Bermuda. Gains strokes with approach like every single week. Like, I don't really, you can't ask for too much else. Um, So I like Lonto and I know, He's at the very, very high end of the mid range, but I'll throw out some, you know, 8,000 Rangers to, to, you know, help us round out lineups. I have someone in the same range as you, uh, as Lonto, and that's Siwoo Kim. I'm back on him this week. We saw, you know, last week that Siwoo Kim can compete on Bermuda because of what he does elsewhere. Did not finish there, which was disappointing, but I'm going to go back to him here at $9,900. The ball striking has been really solid the past few months. So to 33rd and strokes off the tee and 35th and approach, and that's helped to move up to 11th and birdies are better gained in that same sample. The ball striking has also made him less volatile. Like Siwoo Kim has this perception of being hyper volatile. That could still be true. It could be a small sample, but he's been less volatile recently making more cuts. And I think that makes his upside more tempting. There aren't a lot of guys in this range with a flawless profile, which could be a good incentive to do a brand set and just avoid it altogether. But if I'm going to take a risk, I want to take a risk on someone with upside. I think that makes Kim someone I want to target here at $9,900. Uh, Brandon, what is your read on Siwoo Kim here at $9,900? I haven't really looked into him just because I am probably not going to be here as often as I typically am. If this were a more balanced week, I'd be on him. The issue for me with him is just the long-term adjusted form quite as good as some other golfers around his salary because he while being more consistent than he used to be still can kind of come and go and that's scary i think that siwoo kim is one of the few golfers i never want to put into a fandle lineup and would rather just bet him if i'm if i like him that's also something that i i just it's still a bias of mine um but i, I think that he's a justifiable play for sure yeah, that always used to be the case with me with Siwoo Kim, but with the ball striking getting better, I have been very much more receptive to him in DFS. I've actually used him quite a bit the past couple of months, and it's worked out well. So what could go wrong? We'll go back to the Siwoo Kim well this week. Uh, who else do you like here in this mid-range this week? Uh, Taylor Gooch, um, 9,200. I'm going to stick with him after, you know, despite the two missed cuts. I don't think people really like I mean, they don't play Taylor Gooch a ton, so that, that's fine by me. At least, you know, he's not going to be chalky, especially after two missed cuts. Uh, but again, looking at the numbers instead of just the missed cuts, missed the cut on the number at the Sony Open, shot a 70 and a 67. That's fine. Uh, missed the other cut at the RSM by a shot, shot a 71-70. It's like he's been bad. Very balanced golfer, uh, which is why I like him to begin with. Two top 17 finishes the past two years at the American Express. Just honestly, like no, no glaring weaknesses. He is the lone golfer in the low 9,000 range who I would probably want to build around. Okay. I think that that makes sense because of the balance. And I do like Gooch as well. One guy I like down here who is interesting to me is Cameron Davis. He's kind of like Sam Burns without the good Bermuda putting. And that's important because... (laughs) He's pretty bad. So he's a good driver. Yeah. <laughs> Makes, okay, whatever. Uh, he's 129th in uh, Bermuda putting the past 100 rounds. That's a legitimate concern. But he's first in birdies or better gained in part thanks to the fact that he's good on bent grass, uh, but also because he is a good driver. He's got good distance. He's seventh in the field in strokes and off the tee, 51st in approach the past 50 rounds. And again, the birdie number is inflated because he's a good bent grass putter. So we do need to be skeptical of that number specifically. But um, I think there's enough elsewhere to feel good about him. He lost 0.8 in approach to the Sony. So it's not as if he's in like amazing form, but we know he'll gain off the tee. He can do enough elsewhere to be interesting. I'll take that at $9,300. I think that the key phrase you used when saying that Gooch is the only guy you want to build around down here is build around. I think that there are enough flaws in Cameron Davis's profile not to build around him. 
He's not like a 60% exposure type guy. However, I can feel okay getting 30% Cameron Davis because I think that the upside is there. So I think what you said about Gooch is valid. I'm still willing to use Cameron Davis as being a secondary type guy personally. Yeah, I mean, he would be one of the guys I would consider. Um, I'm just settling it more into, and it's always hard because we do this Tuesday, uh, especially with Monday being MLK Day. Like, still really getting a feel for this field, but right, I think it's a week where I'm going to pick four st- four of the studs. Probably Reed, Wolf, Finau, Champ, lock them in as mu- as much as I can, and then just cycle in down here. Davis will be part of that, uh, but he would not be the the one guy I would pick to help me build a lineup that has like Reed Wolf champ. It would be Gooch over Davis, but he would be in the conversation for number two, probably maybe okay. doc, maybe doc Redman. Yeah. Um, even though Redman's not, you know, specifically He's long. I think that Redman is a good play too. I actually haven't mentioned as someone I'd like to get to as opposed to dipping mm-hmm. below 8,000. So I think that Redman works as well. Uh, let's move to the value range. So guys at $9,000 and lower and start things off with a guy who I was on last week did not go well. Uh, mentioned how one missed cut can burn some lineups. Matthew Neesmith, come on down, but you're back on him this week. What puts you on Neesmith for the American Express? Uh, the same, I mean, put you on him last week, still applies this week. Missing one cut doesn't change. Nope. He's, he's uh, off the list, man. Exactly. No but like, invited to the hot tub. But we know that's not the case, or we should know, and we have to keep that you in mind. Know. So You might know. I, I try to know. I try to keep that in mind. Um, I just mentioned all my Siwoo Kim biases, but uh, Neesmith, uh, two missed cuts over his past five starts, but also three top 17 finishes. Had good ball striking in all of them. He's 95th percentile in approach play uh, when adjusted for field uh, since the start of 2020. 71st percentile Bermuda putting. Kind of makes him a standout value play for me. Uh, he played the multi-course setup at the American Express already. Finished 17th a year ago. Gained 5.4 strokes from approach, and of course limited, uh, you know, limited data there. Just the two rounds uh, from the stadium course, but there's a lot to like with Neesmith, and I'm just gonna trust trust the process, Jim. Yeah, I mean, like what you're saying is correct. However, uh, my biases matter more. Um, I think that Neesmith is, in all seriousness, definitely an option once again this week. My concern is that the birdie number is pretty bad. He's not really someone who tends to go low. Does that concern you, or do you think that that will revert and get better because of what he does on his approach play? Um, it should be. Um, I, I have him like above field average in birdie or better rate. Mm-hmm. I could probably try to predict like what your birdie percentage should be. Um, maybe that's something I'll do this yeah. off season, but season project. Um. You know, I think it would be. I think it should get better. Uh, but for the salary, there's not a whole lot to concern me. So I'm good with uh, trusting Nee Smith, or maybe not trusting, but if I got to go to Nee Smith to get up to Matthew Wolf from like as much as we like Sam Burns, it's worth it to me this week. Okay, fair enough. Uh, my first low salary guy is Cameron Tringali, as we alluded to before. He is not good off the tee, and that's a bummer. Uh, but he might be able to do enough elsewhere to get by. Specifically, Tringali has great irons, ranks 18th in the field in approach, which has helped him get birdies or better at the 15th highest rate in the field per Fantasy National. He is slightly above average on Bermuda as well, which definitely helps. He finished out 2020, finishing third at the RSM. He was also third at the 3M Open, and he did those while gaining less than two strokes off the tee. So off the tee matters, but he can do enough elsewhere to make up for it. I don't think Tringali is a legit threat to win. So the upside here is not great, Uh, but the ceiling is decent. I think that he's a good floor because he's decently balanced and that's enough for me to use him. I think it's kind of similar to the Cameron Davis discussion where I don't want to go 60%. I think it's kind of similar to what you said, where I want to build around the studs, commit to my studs, differentiate in the value play range. Is someone is Tringali someone you will use while differentiating down there or no? Yeah, he's one of my favorite plays down here. Um, I mean, he had been a mainstay for us for a long time, uh, just cooled off. But I mean, the the, the long term form is still good. Um, 90, uh, 92nd percentile uh, with 
adjusted strokes gain approach, 76th and distance gain. So there's a lot to like, but nobody's flawless. Is Tringali significantly better than like a Chess and Hadley for an extra thousand? You're asking the wrong person. Yeah. I have a I have a weakness for Chess and he's my yeah. boy. So I, I think that whenever Tringali at 9K is definitely far from flawless, it makes me just want to get up to an extra, you know, instance of exposure to like a now if I can. Sure. So that that's where I'm coming from. I'm gonna talk about Chess and Hadley actually, just because I mentioned him. He's my second low salary pick uh, at eight thousand uh, plus t- or <laughs> two hundred twenty to one to win. So again, you know, these guys have issues down here, but good Bermuda putter, eighty seventh percentile, solid overall, just adjusted strokes gained, fifty third percentile among this field since the start of twenty twenty which is pretty good for the 8,000 salary has missed three of the past five cuts, but three top 25s in the past seven with, you know, like fine ball striking. He's like field average, but I don't know what else you want from, from someone down here. Um, I don't know. Like this is a very different field than what we've been dealing with. And like the better part of the season, even some of these swing season events have been a little deeper. I think it drops off a lot. So, I'm just going to embrace the DGAF a bit and try to get up to the, you know, a third stud probably. Yeah. Chesson has uh, not been super kind to me, but we still, we still have a thing. A little fling. So I could consider him for sure. He'd be the one guy I would turn to down here. I just don't think I'll be down here that often, but like, I think Hadley makes a lot of sense. if You do go down there. Uh, I like Charlie Hoffman talked about before with the improving form. And that's largely what gets me in on Hoffman here. The stats are solid, top 50 in all four key stats. The best mark is actually 29th and birdies are better game. So should be able to score, which is reassuring. But like I said, I'd probably like to live in the range right above this. I think that Lucas Glover is an option. The putting, you know, uh, Doc Redman is there around the green. Uh, Cameron Davis, Eric Van Royen. You know, they all have flaws. I think that they have more upside than some of these guys, but I think that Hoffman would be the first guy I'd turn to below 9,000. I get your your reasoning makes sense. You've talked me into it for the most part where I should just take the discount if I'm going to use someone who's flawed, but I think that like those guys are still interesting to me. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I'm with you. Like it those are they're still better plays. Are they substantially better plays? To me, they're not if the difference is, you know, because look, we're sticking on Sam Burns and Cameron Champ. People listening might not like those plays and say, you know, what about Paul Casey or Adam Long's 10 4? Uh, like, Ricky, like, there's such a big tier difference between the 11K and the 10K for the most part that I'm okay, you know, with the, the smaller drop off between the 9 and 8K range. Yeah, I think. But you're you're cor- you're correct that the names that we're talking about um, around nine thousand, you know, Gooch, Redman, uh, Davis, Tringali, Charlie Hoffman, they're they're better plays than like a Neesmith or, um, Chess and Hadley, some like these kinds of guys. But I don't think it's enough to like build around Kevin Na instead, <laughs> or like Phil. Or yeah. Patton Kazire. <laughs> yeah. You know. So I don't know. That, I'm not that's right. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um well, let's finish up here with win picks. Neither of us had Kevin Na last week. Shocker. So uh still hunting. Trying to get that first victory. Uh, again, if you're new to the or rejoining the podcast after the new year, we have changed things up on the win picks. We're just picking our favorite straight bets based on the current odds. Over at FanDuel Sportsbook, uh, we can overlap in golfers. Uh, did we overlap in burger last week or was it someone else no it was burger at the tournament of champions okay okay so i have two names in mind um do you want to go first or do you want me to i can go first because i have to i need to figure out what's best um in terms of picking like favorites and picking long shot because one long shot would go a long way uh in right. our competition um so i'm gonna I'm gonna st- I'm gonna start with the long shot because I like this number a lot, but I'm gonna go with Lonto Griffin at eighty to one. Okay, interesting. He's actually lengthened. Yeah, from seventy to eighty. Yeah. Okay. 
Did we uh, talked about that before. Eric Aaron, what did we talk about that before? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, in, in passing, and then I talked about Lonto and player picks. Okay, so you have Lonto Griffin. I my first one's going to be Sam Burns. He is fifty to one right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. I just like the combination of being able to drive and putt. I think that's really valuable this week. So I think that Burns at fifty to one is my favorite option in the field. So I'm going to go with him. Who is your second one besides Lonto? I'm going to go Patrick Reed at nineteen to one. Okay, I feel good with him. That's a solid enough number. Um, I'm going to trust the trust the model here uh, and go with Reed. My second pick is tough because I'm torn between going with a shorter person and going with like a long shot. I think this is a good field in which to take some swings Mm -hmm. on guys. The problem is the one long shot I want to target. It's a really bad putter on Bermuda and I don't want to do that. So I think I'm just going to say whatever and go Sung Im instead. He's 20 to one. Okay. I was very close picking Siwoo Kim. Could not quite get myself to say it out loud. So I'm just going to go with Sung Im and Sam Burns. Sung Im 20 to one, Sam Burns 50. You have Patrick Reed at 19 to one, Alonto Griffin at 80 to one. You're going to Sung Jae back to back. I did. You took him last week. Yeah. I don't remember that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I can't remember five minutes ago, so it's no shock that I can remember, <laughs> I can't remember last week. But uh, who's Lonto Griffin again? I mean, I don't know. You no, tell, like, me. Like you tell me, buddy. I mean, reading Lonto are top three in expected value in my in my model, so I just kind of have to trust it this week. Who's the other one? Gary Woodland, which is I can see why. <laughs> Understandable. Uh Speaking of Gary Woodland, do not forget, later today, Brandon will be live on the FanDuel YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Periscope channels answering your questions, like my Gary Woodland question right there, and going through his win sims, going through his favorite betting plays, favorite DFS plays for the American Express. 3.30 p.m. Eastern today on the FanDuel YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Periscope channels. You can also watch that after the fact on YouTube. If you don't catch it live, you can go to YouTube. Check it out there if you missed it on Tuesday and get all Brandon's insights there. Also, make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed, not just PGA and NFL. We will have an NFL podcast on Thursday for the conference championships. Tom Vecchio is back with Daily NBA and NHL podcasts every weekday. Also, Austin Swain is back on the UFC grind. I believe there's a pretty big event this week. So make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed, no matter where you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Brandon, if people have questions to you on Twitter before your Q&A later today, where can they find you there? I'm at Gadula13, G-D-U-L-A-1-3. And I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck with your DFS lineups and your bets for the American Express. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by Numberfire.